Good morning. My name is Emanuele Di Lorenzo from Georgia Tech, and today I'm, I will be ta presenting a talk entitled Increased Variance and Synchrony in North Pacific Climate and Ecosystem. This is work in collaboration with uh, Brian Black and two uh, young PhD students, Giovanni Liquori and Yong Jin Kyo. Before beginning, I would like to provide a, a short primer on North Pacific climate variability. And our story uh, begins by looking at the mean winter atmospheric circulation depicted here with the mean sea level pressure in the North Pacific, uh, showing these, uh, this uh, system of low pressure and high pressure. If we draw the wind vectors, uh, we recognize the familiar uh, trajectory of the westerly winds here in the higher latitudes and of the trade winds. Now, in terms of atmospheric variability, there are two types of variability that uh, impact this, uh, this atmosphere. Uh, one is a change in the location of the westerly, for example, a north uh, or southward shift of this uh, trajectory. Uh, the other one is simply a change in the strength of the westerly themselves. So let's look at the change in location first, which is depicted here. Uh, the change in location typically happens when there is an extension of this Aleutian low uh, southward, uh, which also implies a southward shift in the storm tracks. And this is a typical uh, kind of atmospheric variability that we, in fact, see during the Pacific Decadal Oscillation expression in the ocean. Now, the other uh, atmospheric variability is a change in strength, which is represented here and typically is associated with the dipolar structure and the sea level pressure anomaly shown here, uh, which emerges also as the second uh, dominant mode of atmospheric variability. And this is typically associated with intensification of the storm tracks you know, along the westerly trajectory. So these two dominant uh, types of atmospheric variability, essentially change in location, change in the strength, have an uh, oceanic uh, footprint. And in particular, uh, the change in location uh, typically is what drives uh, the so-called PDO, or Pacific Decadal Oscillation type pattern, which is shown here in the sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, whether the change in location typically drives a pattern that is more reminiscent of the North Pacific gyro oscillation, which is shown here. And these two patterns have also been referred in the literature as the Go Goa or Gulf of Alaska pattern because the SST anomalies are typically, you know, in the offshore region, uh, you know, let's say in the Gulf of Alaska here. Or also this one on this side, the PDO, is also referred as the arc pattern because it kind of hugs uh, the coast in this kind of arc pattern like this. So these two uh, pattern of oceanic and atmospheric variability are particularly dominant in the winter. And in fact, we can extract, these patterns were extracted by looking at the EOFs of winter sea surface temperature, uh, in this case, January, February, March, uh, and are shown here. And I, I just want to put them up there uh, to kind of start talking a little bit about these patterns. Uh, so we know a lot about these two types of patterns. Uh, we know that they explain the largest fraction of North Pacific decadal variability. Uh, the expression of this pattern is also associated with a, a delayed impact in the western boundary currents. Uh, and in the Kurosha region, typically happening uh, through the emanation of large-scale Rossby waves that carry these signatures in the western boundary. Typically, uh, you know, they've been described as statistically independent because they come up from, you know, using EOFs of, of sea surface temperature. But in reality, dynamically, they're not independent. In fact, if we look at the time series of these two EOFs or these two patterns, say the NPGO type and the PDO type, uh, which are shown here in blue and red, uh, we find that, for example, during the strong uh, warm event of 2014-15, this warm event started uh, as a Gulf of Alaska pattern and then uh, kind of migrated that following winter into this kind of uh, PDO type pattern. In fact, if we do a cross-correlation between the winter principal components of EOF, uh, we find that there is, um, which is shown here, so this is a correlation as a function of different lags, so lag zero, of course, they're independent because they're UF, so there's zero correlation. But you can see as you move on this side of the lag, uh, one year, you see significant correlation of 0.6 when this Gulf of Alaska pattern leads uh, the, this essentially PDO type or arc pattern. Now, this uh, significant correlation, actually, we can uh, split this and see in time and see how stationary it is in time. So we can actually run this lead correlation between EOF2 in the winter and the following winter EOF1. And we can make a plot of the running correlation as a function of time over a 20-year window, which is shown here. And this actually is very revealing because it shows that early in the 40s and 60s, the, the coupling between these two modes, that one-year lag, wasn't very strong. But then it increased significantly with a very kind of uh, marketed trend uh, in this time series, 
So that, of course, poses the question is what is the mechanism linking these two patterns and why is there a trend in this coupling? Uh, to do that, uh, we have to essentially think about tropical variability and in particular El Nino. So we know that when we have El Nino, for example, in the summer and fall, there are teleconnections to the extra tropics, which are represented here, that essentially imprint part of the El Nino variability into the Pacific Decadal Oscillation pattern, which is shown here. But we also have known for quite a while that this particular pattern, uh, associated with this kind of Gulf of Alaska and PGO type pattern, also can act as a stochastic excitation of ENSO. There's many papers that document that. And so in principle, the link, the dynamical link, is really in the fact that this pattern acts as a stochastic excitation of ENSO, and then ENSO teleconnects back the signal uh, to the extratropics. So we have this kind of coupling between tropics, sorry, between extratropics to tropics and vice versa, uh, which can essentially lead these, uh, the connection between these two modes in the North Pacific. But how, how does it, this, how does this pattern essentially trigger El Nino? To understand that, uh, we need to look at the sea level pressure and wind vectors anomaly uh, that drive that pattern, which are shown here. This is sea level pressure. We see a dipole, which is a change in the strength of the westerlies. And uh, in this case, here we also see um, you know, that the wind vector act as uh, weakening the trade winds. Now, if we look more large scale in this region of the subtropics where these wind vectors are weakening the trade winds, this weakening essentially uh, reduces uh, uh, the evaporation and warms the sea surface temperature. So we get a warm SST. It turns out that in this region, the ocean and the atmosphere are strongly coupled. And so this uh, uh, essentially ignites a feedback that makes this SST anomaly grow and essentially move towards the equator. And this particular dynamic is well known and, and as the meridional modes dynamic and typically happens during the spring. Now, at the end of these meridional mode evolution, we have essentially an SST anomaly that has reached, at the end of the spring, the tropics. And in the tropics, these SST anomalies essentially can trigger uh, an evolution or an, or an initiation of an El Nino during the summer and fall. And the El Nino uh, you know, will have some anomalies in the convection patterns, uh, which essentially shift. And so we have a high uh, sea level pressure here and low sea level pressure here. And this uh, anomaly in convection triggers atmospheric Rossby waves aloft in the troposphere, uh, which essentially uh, are what we call the ENSO teleconnections, which drive uh, then this uh, change in the northern atmospheric sea level pressure variability, and in particular, the southward shift and intensification of this Aleutian low, which we see he, here, which is the driver of the PDO type pattern. So with this kind of uh, dynamic, we go from uh, an NPGO-like pattern in the winter to an ENSO-like expression in the following uh, fall and summer, and then with the teleconnection back to another, to the following winter PDO-like expression. Now this particular mechanism of chit-chat, if you like, between extratropics and tropics has been uh, used as an hypothesis to actually explain uh, the Pacific Decadal Variability in a paper in 2015. And it's also been invoked uh, as, a, as a way to explain the multi-year persistence of the warm blob, uh, which appeared first in the winter 2014, had then a weak ENSO expression uh, in, the, in the fall, and then uh, we had an intensification again uh, of the warm blob uh, in the winter of 2015. But you can see that the pattern has shifted from a kind of an open ocean pattern to the more arc-like pattern. So there's evidence that this type of decadal variability is actually uh, increasing significantly uh, over time. And let me, so let's review this evidence. So this is a paper uh, that is not uh, published yet. Uh, it's uh, by Liguori et al. And what Liguori did, he looked at, uh, at an index of Pacific decadal variability. Essentially, you can think of, for example, the, the first principal component of the low frequency sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific. And he plotted that index for the observations. And then he also looked at that index in several models. Uh, this is an example of one of the climate models that he used from the so-called community Earth system model, large ensemble. And so you have essentially some decadal variability in these indices. And now what you can do is you can take example, uh, the running variance of this index to see how the variance is changing through time, which is plotted here. So in black, again, this is the one realization of the observation showing that there's a significant increase in the, in the variance of this Pacific Decadal Variability Index. And, and here in blue, uh, this is essentially the same analysis, but it's conducted on 30 members of this uh, community air system model, CSM lens, uh, 
uh, under the scenario RCP 8.5, which is a greenhouse scenario. And so what you're seeing here is the ensemble mean, and, and the blue here is the spread of the ensemble. So in both the observation and in the climate model simulation under greenhouse forcing, you find that there's a significant increase in the decadal variance uh, of the Pacific. So what this suggests then, if you increase the Pacific decadal variance, you also expect to increase the variance of the traditional ecosystem drivers, both in the coastal ocean, open ocean, and land. And in particular, I'm going to explore some of these ecosystem drivers uh, that are upwelling uh, indices, uh, sea level uh, gauges, uh, tide gauges, rivers, and droughts. So this is more of a, of a land component than a coastal ocean component because we have long-term observations of these things, so we can test this hypothesis. And this is work uh, done with Brian Black. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a map of the correlations between the Pacific Decadal Variability Index, if you like, uh, versus these ecosystem drivers. And the correlation here is plotted for a period of 1920 to 1970, that is the early part of the record, versus the later part of the record, 1970 to 2015. And here are all the different you know, uh, uh, essential ecosystem drivers like uh, rivers, upwelling, sea level, precipitation, and some indicators of, of land ecosystem like blue oak. And in general, what you see is that there's an increase in the fingerprint of the correlation uh, as you transition towards the later part, signifying that uh, essentially this increase in variance uh, is also uh, essentially giving more correlation with these ecosystem drivers. But not only that, we can also look at these ecosystem drivers, these long time series, and look at the running variance of these, which is shown here. And so here is from 1900 to, to present is the running variance of these different ecosystem drivers on the coast from long-term observations. We have rivers, sea level record, tide gauges, upwelling indices, uh, and precipitation records. And all of them actually confirm, uh, at least in the in situ data, that there seems to be a significant trend in the, in the variance associated with these ecosystem drivers. So to summarize then, we can say that the significant increase in the Pacific Decadal Variance has uh, essentially led to an increase in the variance of traditional ecosystem drivers in land and also in the coastal ocean. Um, and what's also interesting is that we can compute the correlation among these different drivers as a, as a way to measure, uh, if you like, the synchrony uh, between these uh, variability in these ecosystem drivers. And if we did that, this is the pairwise correlation of all these uh, in situ long-term uh, ecosystem drivers. And we find indeed that the correlation among them uh, seems also to increase over time, uh, you know, almost in every single of these um, uh, pairwise correlations. So this suggests that this increase in variance uh, of the ecosystem drivers has also led to an increase in the ecosystem synchrony uh, because, um, because of this pairwise correlation, which could imply that there is a reduction of the so-called portfolio effect. In other words, all the ecosystems uh, start to align uh, uh, under one particular type of variability, which means that when that is, uh, is dramatically negative, it could impact you know, all the ecosystems and so reduce the resilience of the ecosystem. So of course then the question that uh, we need to address is why is Pacific Decadal Variance increasing and is this uh, somehow related to, to greenhouse forcing? So let's go back to our hypothesis and the first hypothesis could be that the ENSO variance is increasing, so this loop here is increasing, therefore energizing the North Pacific Decadal Variability. However, this particular loop alone does not explain the increase in the coupling that we have between the PDO-like and the NPGO-like pattern. So another uh, additional hypothesis is that also the meridional modes, uh, which is this link here, are getting stronger with time. Uh, to address that hypothesis, we were going to use a simple uh, kind of a differential equation for the sea surface temperature uh, variability of the meridional mode. Uh, and so we're going to say that the rate of change of the sea surface temperature variability of this meridional mode is essentially equal to a forcing term, which is here, associated with these off equatorial trade winds, which initiate or is stochastic forcing for the meridional mode. And of course, the amplitude is dictated by a sensitivity parameter alpha here. And then we have a decay of the SST. So essentially, we have rate of change, forcing, and decay. Now, with this simple equation, we can actually write uh, now an equation for the variance of the SST, or if you like, of the meridional mode. And this looks uh, like this. We have that the variance of the SST is essentially proportional to uh, the amplitude of the sensitivity parameter, alpha square. Uh, this is really the sensitivity of the sea surface temperature to the winds, times the variance of the winds, divided by this term that is a function of the, of the dissipation timescale memory of the ocean. 
So what we can do now is we can essentially look at these parameters in, in climate models and observations and see if they are consistent with this hypothesis. And so let's start with uh, looking at the variance of the winds and the variance of the meridional mode, SST, and which is shown here in these plots. So this plot shows here uh, on this axis time, and, uh, and these various colors are essentially ensemble means uh, taken from this uh, climate model ensemble of the CSM lens uh, with the scenario uh, RCP 8.5, and there are 30 members there. And, and in black are the one realization of the observations, and all these are 20-year running standard deviations of, of essentially these, these quantities here. So you can see that the, the off-equatorial wind variance is definitely increasing over time in the model, and some hint also in the observations. Uh, the meridional mode uh, SST variance is also increasing significantly in the model and also in the observations, although here in the observation is very strong. And associated with that, we also find in the model an increase in the ENSO uh, variance, which is also kind of consistent a little bit with the observations. So definitely there is an increase in the, in the stochastic forcing uh, of this meridional mode, and we can see it both in the winds and the response in the SST. Uh, we can also look at this alpha parameter, which is the sensitivity, and this is really a function of the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. And we find that in the large ensemble uh, simulation of the CSM, uh, plotted here in magenta line, we find that, uh, you know, about 2010 or so, uh, there seems to be a strong trend uh, of this parameter, so that uh, this alpha essentially is uh, essentially giving a stronger response of the SSC uh, when there's a perturbation in the winds. Now, unfortunately, the observation, uh, there seems to be some kind of a negative trend, but of course this is one realization, so it's, it's hard to, to put, you know, any um, significant statistical significance, especially because this is a kind of a noisy parameter to compute. So it seems like that this hypothesis that meridional modes are getting stronger uh, could actually be important. And uh, I want to now conclude uh, with some remarks about, uh, about these dynamics. Uh, first, uh, I think we, we have a significant, we have shown evidence for a significant increase in the Pacific decadal variability, uh, both in observations and climate models. And this increase in Pacific decadal variance uh, has led to two important uh, elements. One, there's an increased coupling between the PDO and NPGO. Uh, both in observation and climate models. And this coupling comes from the fact that when these meridional modes are stronger, uh, they essentially have a higher impact on ENSO, and therefore, by having a higher impact on ENSO, they have a higher likelihood of essentially triggering these other teleconnections, which leads to the coupling. The other important thing is the increase in PDV variance has also led to an increase in variance in ecosystem drivers. And this is also evident from long-term in situ observations, which I showed you uh, on, uh, on, along the California coast, both land and, and marine. And because of this, uh, this increase in variance and increased coupling has led to an apparent increase in ecosystem synchrony, which is very evident in the long-term in situ observations, which in turn uh, can lead to this reduction of a portfolio effect in both ocean and land ecosystems. I also showed that there's some preliminary evidence that this increase in variance may be uh, a function, may be controlled uh, by greenhouse forcing, uh, that will lead to an increase uh, or stronger meridional modes and ENSO variance. And this concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. And one last thing before concluding, I also would like to point out that uh, we have a new program at George Tech in Ocean Science and Engineering. It's an interdisciplinary PhD program, and, and we are essentially accepting applications for the inaugural class this year. Uh, and, uh, and so please visit our website. And if you're interested, uh, please distribute to your students Thank you very much.